Welcome everybody to uh, the first webinar of 2021. I'm, I'm sure we all wish that 2021 looks an awful lot better than 2020, but uh, that's, that's a hope, a target rather than a forecast. Um, we're going to start with one of the CMAF uh, members, Ivan Svetonkov. There's a poor pronunciation uh, of uh, Ivan's name. Um, talking about the integration of uh, different uh, time series forecasting approaches in a single approach to infinity and beyond. Well, uh, it, uh, I, I guess that's uh, um, a, a reference to, uh, uh, I want to say Star Wars, it's not Star Wars, it's the, uh, uh, the other one. No. Anyway, let me uh, welcome you all and just make a few words of introduction to uh, the centre for those of you who uh, are new. Uh, the centre um, provides a number of services. It's focused essentially on a, uh, developing research of practical value to organisations, including such things as software development, uh, consultancy somewhat uh, with our MSCs, uh, we have a number of summer projects, usually about 15 a year, working with companies on their problems. And we also deliver short courses, both to uh, bespoke for particular organisations and open courses as well. Uh, ex expertise in, of course, forecasting uh, of vari various forms, the processes of forecasting, the models of forecasting, but also uh, machine learning and marketing analytics. Um, the center has a, a picture, <coughs> a number of uh, members, handsome people facing you. Um, uh, let's move quickly on and move to the next slide then. Um, these webinars have proved uh, particularly successful. We had something like five last, uh, uh, last semester and we've got uh, six coming up. Some are internal. Um, more often we have uh, presenters from uh, uh, software companies and uh, covering a variety of topics. The aim is to have uh, practical presentations which have immediate application. Um, you've got a list there. Um, Nikos Karensis talking about hierarchical forecasting. Uh, Stefan Kolasa, who is a, a fellow of the uh, center, but works in Switzerland for SAP on forecasting retail demand. Um, I hope you'll join us. Over to the next slide where Ivan will talk about a course that we deliver in demand forecasting with R. Ivan, over to you. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks, Robert. So uh, we, we are also planning to um, deliver a couple of uh, online courses in 2021, uh, demand forecasting with R. So if you're interested uh, in increasing your knowledge in this area, please uh, sign in. Uh, the course is uh, made for demand planners, data scientists and business analysts, but it will focus on the uh, forecasting process, not just uh, on using R. So this is this is the strong uh, side of the course. Uh, it, the first one will be held uh, on 26th, uh, 30th of April. Uh, we will have three hours each day um, and it will be well online using probably using Teams. You can find details about the course on our landing page. Here is the address. Right. What else? Uh, Keep in touch with us. We have uh, different social media. We, we are on Twitter, on LinkedIn. You can send us an email directly, and visit our website. And we even have our YouTube channel where we publish all the videos from the webinars and uh, some of our forums. Uh, so, it's infinity and beyond. Uh, actually, the reference is to the Toy Story. It was a character Buzz Lightyear, and this is, was uh, his catchphrase to infinity and beyond. Uh, so let me start with uh, this sort of general questions. When you have to forecast something, how do you forecast? What models do you use typically? 
uh, every one of you would have their own answers, I guess, because you have your favorite models. But in general, if we are interested in demand forecasting, then it would be exponential smoothing in ETS framework. It can be a regression or it can be ARIMA model. Th these are the three main. Yes, you can have something else, your favorite model here or method here, and uh, you can have uh, simple moving averages or machine learning methods or anything else. But these three, first three, are in a way the most uh, fundamental. So any paper you look in statistics, it will mention one of these three. And in a way, we also know that if we want to compare our forecasts with something, if we want to make sure that our model is better, then we have need to have benchmarks, and these three are typical benchmarks in the area. Uh, at the same time, almost all textbooks will tell you that uh, these three are distinct models. Uh, they are typically formulated differently, and as the result, uh, yes, you can sometimes combine them, for example, ETSX, so ETS plus regression, or ARIMAX, ARIMA plus regression, but in general, they are not comparable with each other. Um, at least not comparable using statistical uh, methods like information criteria and so on. So in general, in the perception of statisticians and forecasters, it's just different techniques that you can apply to the data. Well, this is all fake news, fake information, lies everywhere. Don't believe your statistical uh, statistics textbooks. Uh, talking seriously, uh, these methods are already implemented in Spooth package uh, using different functions. Uh, here they are listed uh, ES, SARIM, and so on, and they are already directly comparable. Uh, but I realized that these functions, these approaches, have their limitations. For example, you cannot have ETS and ARIMA. Uh, at least not using smooth functions, and I don't know if any uh, R functions that would do that. Um, the other thing, you can only work with normal distribution. That's something that uh, every conventional statistical model assumes. But we know that this is a very strong assumption, and reality is much more different than just normality and bell curve. You don't, we don't have no, we don't have time varying parameters in those models, and uh, we cannot deal with multiple seasonality. So we actually, if we have multiple seasonality, we would go and use TBUDs or double seasonal halt winters. So something uh, different, something completely different. And uh, I thought that uh, having all these different elements, uh, it would make sense to unite them in uh, some more general framework. So this is what Adam is for, and this is Adam. Just to <laughs> make sure we, we understand, this is Adam on the left. And on the right, we have Flying Spaghetti Monster. And yes, uh, this is uh, the, the present of Flying Spaghetti Monster in the form of a smooth package. Uh, right, so what is Adam? Adam is uh, augmented dynamic adaptive model. Um, dynamic. No, actually should start with augmented. Augmented uh, means that it's not just ETS, it's not just ARIMA, it's uh, something bigger. Dynamic implies that we have these dynamic structures of ARIMA or of ETS, so or time varying parameters model. And adaptive refers to this property of uh, some of the parameters or components of the model to change over time, to adapt to changes. It is actually a single source of error state space model, if uh, this tells you anything. Uh, if it doesn't, then uh, this has the direct link to exponential smoothing in ETS form. And it implements uh, these three things that I've already mentioned, plus different combinations of the three. Um, it also supports components and variables and orders a selection mechanism. Normal, non normal distribution, advanced and custom losses. So the list is actually quite big what it supports, uh, supports. Uh, and I don't have aim to cover all the aspects here. In a way, you can think of Adam as a first benchmark. So you have your favorite uh, machine learning method and you can benchmark Adam against it uh, and, and see whether it beats it or not. 
it's good for experimenting. For example, you found some data, you want to investigate it, make it make exponential smoothing work for you with some addition of explanatory variables and so on. Then you can use Adam. Um, it's good for prototyping. So after experimenting, you can come up with some model that you can then um, code or create in a different language which would be used in, in your company, let's say. And it's good for research because it is very flexible uh, thing. As I said, for example, you can have custom loss functions. So if you don't like MSE for estimating exponential smoothing, you can use whatever you want. Let's say Huber uh, loss or, well, min, max loss and so on. So you can experiment, you can do a lot of things. All the details and technical aspects uh, are summa summarized in the online textbook and I'm working on. This is still work in progress. It covers some important elements already, for example, explaining how the model is constructed, but it's far from uh, being finished. So I hope that uh, I will find time uh, in 2021 to uh, write a small section after another and uh, finish it in this year. Uh, okay, instead of going through all the features, that, that would be a very boring presentation, I decided to do four case studies. And the first is fast-moving consumer goods, so those products that are typically sold in retail and are sold quite fine. Uh, then some elements of promotional modeling, intermittent demand and multiple seasonal data. So let's see, let's start with uh, fast moving consumer go goods. So those products that sell quite well. Uh, here is an example. I have uh, data sales of household products uh, on a store level, and we will use uh, last 12 uh, observations uh, from this data for the test set just to see how the model performs. What can we say about this data? Well, first, uh, it seems uh, to either have a trend or uh, slowly changing level. We have seasonality, quite well pronounced seasonality. Uh, they seem to evolve over time. Uh, there is something happening in the very beginning of the data, but it shouldn't uh, impact our final forecast. Hopefully it shouldn't. And what we can do here is use exponential smoothing as uh, proposed by Heinemann et al. in 2008 textbook. That's what we do in Adam. And in fact, ETS is the um, base of the function. So you can build upon it, you can switch it off, but by default, it will be there. So this is the command I would use in R. Uh, I use normal distribution for this case. And here is what we get. So the purple line here shows how the model fits the data. The blue line shows the point forecast. And I, the model automatically selected uh, M and M model. So multiplicative error, no trend and multiplicative seasonality. Some parameters, not very useful or informative, but here they are. Uh, information criteria. This is uh, quite uh, useful when you want to compare different models. The lower this value is, the better the model is, very roughly. And for the holdout, uh, I also report MACE and RMSSE just to, to make a point uh, or to see how it performs on average for this specific small part of data. This is obviously not a competition. We don't have an aim to select the greatest model but we want to see how it works. So we fit the model, we can now analyze the residuals and we do that using the simple command plot Adam model and by default it will produce these four plots, these actual versus fitted values, the other way around. Uh, the closer these, uh, th these points to the uh, gray line, the better it is, meaning that uh, we've explained the, the data quite well. Residuals versus fitted, uh, we typically would look at uh, heteroskedasticity or something like that here. Uh, standardized residuals, do we see any patterns? I don't think that we see any patterns in the residuals, which also means that uh, this model is fine. There is one observation, number 14, that lies outside of the interval, which could be still fine because we expect 95% of observations to lie here. 
but we could investigate this observation number 14 and see what happened there. And uh, QQ plot just to see whether the distribution of residuals follows normal or not. So overall, by looking at this, I would say that uh, it's actually fine. Not that bad. Yes, uh, observation number 14 is a bit alarming, but uh, in general, it seems that everything behaves well. We can do further analysis. Uh, actually, this plot function produces uh, 12 different things, and you can specify which specifically, what specifically to plot. So I ask uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 8 and 9, stand for standardized residuals over time and studentized residuals over time. They're quite similar, so um, we can just stick with this one, I guess. And uh, 10, 11, autocorrelation function and partial autocorrelation function of residuals. So this one tells me that 14 uh, could ha have happened by chance, but it is um, somehow related to the other observations, which are also quite low. Uh, ACF and PACF actually don't show anything uh, significant. Uh, I mean, there is lag number four, but this could happen at, uh, at random as well. So I wouldn't bother too much about that. So let's see what happens uh, on observation 14. Uh, this is the same feat as before, and we can see the orange dots. One corresponds, well, they correspond to the observation 14. So this is the case where the model actually uh, had much higher value than it should have had. So what can we do with this? Can we do something with this observation 14? Well, we can just check whether uh, this is an outlier or not, something like that. We can create a dummy variable. And here comes the, some elements of uh, dynamic model, I guess. We create dummy variable, which is equal to zero everywhere, but on 14th observation and we create sort of a data frame and we feed the model providing this data frame. By default, Adam will use the first column of the first variable as response variable and all the others as explanatory variables. So that's what happens here and what do we get? Here's the fit, not very different from the previous one. And AIC C is actually higher than previous. So uh, formally, from statistical point of view, we would say that if this is higher, then we shouldn't bother. In a way, we can see that uh, the addition of this 14th has decreased the peak a little bit, but uh, hasn't solved the prob problem completely. So may maybe ETS MNM is good enough. We don't need to bother with uh, explanatory variables. Okay, uh, just as an example, this is uh, time series decomposition according to the model. Uh, sometimes it is useful to look at that because then you can see how your components change over time and what happens uh, with the residuals. But uh, here I put it just for the purposes of demonstration what you can do. Summary of the model. This is something completely new. You can have uh, your smoothing parameters and uh, confidence intervals for them. So they tell us that uh, in your sample alpha was equal to 0.8 but in reality, it might differ if you increase or decrease your sample, and it would uh, be somewhere from 0 0.63 to uh, 1, very roughly. Uh, but else, uh, we can also, if we're really interested in this, uh, have a look at the feed seat line and the confidence interval for it. So this is what uh, this function does. And we can produce forecasts. So I just decided to produce the upper bound of the interval. That's how the forecast would look. So this is just the, an example of uh, this fast moving consumer goods, but there are other things as well. Uh, promotional modeling, backyard sale, 25 cents. So in this case, we have weekly data. And some of you know that for example, conventional ETS from forecast package uh, does not work uh, on the data with frequency higher than 24. So when we have weekly data, the frequency is um, approximately 52. So we approximately have 52 weeks in the year. And we actually have several promotions happening with these uh, big things. So let's see if we can fit uh, some model here and do something. We will use uh, ETS again with explanatory variables. 
but we will ask function to select them from pure models only. So this will consider either pure additive models or pure multiplicative models and then compare them in, and select the best one. Uh, we need to tell function what sort of lag, seasonal lag we have. And here I say uh, 52. So it's uh, just predict 52. Um, assume that the pattern repeats itself every 52 observations and forecast holdout. So this is what we get. Uh, as you see, here is the feed. The line goes somehow in the data. Uh, not perfect. Obviously, these peaks cannot be captured by the model, and as the result, they are not very well predicted in the holdout. Uh, the whole process of fitting this, selecting, and so on took for me around three seconds, 2.6 seconds. And AIC is 3072. Okay, can we improve this model? Yeah, we can actually introduce uh, explanatory variables with uh, those promotions that we have. And I also use this function from uh, Greybox package, which will automatically create lugs. So it will create lug one, lug two. Why do I need that? Well, if you look at uh, those promotions, you can see that there is a peak and after that there is a decline. So maybe there is something related with uh, this uh, effect when people buy product one week, but next week they tend not to buy it because they've already have uh, a lot of product at home. That's what happens. Uh, AACC has reduced, become smaller. So we can see that the function uh, approximates these peaks well, and I would say that uh, it does maybe slightly better in terms of capturing them for the holdout. This took me uh, 0.6 seconds to, to feed this model. Uh, I also not sure actually that I sh should uh, include this in the uh, slides, but I've included it anyway. We can actually have regressors that would change over time. So the parameters for promotions would change over time. That's what uh, this adapt stands for. Uh, here how it looks, but uh, it's, it's actually not better than the previous model. Uh, given all these uh, several models, we can compare them and we can select uh, the best performing, which is uh, EDSX with uh, static regressors. And it's actually good because dynamic regressors uh, model, while it might do better in terms of uh, mean, it introduces additional uncertainty. So if you have chance, use the static one because the uh, prediction intervals will be narrower in this case. Uh, we could also use ARIMA, uh, but keep in mind that uh, while ARIMA is already available in Adam, it is still work in progress. So I'm not satisfied with the order selection mechanism there. I will improve it uh, over the next few months, probably. And um, I'm also not very satisfied with the initialization. But still, if we do that, uh, we can get some uh, ARIMA model. In this case, it's uh, SARIMA, seasonal ARIMA of these orders, not very important. You can see how it fits the data. It took uh, almost five seconds to calculate, which is much worse <laughs> than it is. But good news, we can directly compare it with the previous model. We can see that AAC here is higher, so it's not uh, worth it. it. Seems to be doing uh, worse in terms of AAC than the previous models. Right. So forecast, final from forecast for this data from our best model is like this because as you see the last three observations were at the bottom of the series. Maybe stores were closed or maybe something else happened, that's why uh, they went uh, to this level. But if we expect that after some time our stores will reopen, we will get back to norm, then maybe we can include these values as explanatory variables, as additional dummies, and refit the model and produce forecast based on this information, which will look like this. So in this case, model just considers these uh, last three observations as uh, happening, well, uh, element of the model, and then it does not change the level as it would in the previous situation. It's up to you to decide which of the two forecasts is more suitable because you might have some information that, uh, well, model doesn't have. Right. I still have a couple more topics to cover. My time is running out. 
Uh, let's have a look at intermittent demand. Uh, I couldn't find any good picture for intermittent demand uh, from Toy Story. It's actually a challenge to find a picture on the topic of intermittent demand from any movie or cartoon. But the idea is uh, the demand becomes non-continuous. You have zeros in the data. So I have a hobbies product. This is daily data. Uh, and we can see what, what happens here. It has a lot of zeros, right? People don't buy this product every day when they go to the store, they just buy it occasionally. Uh, we can use IETS model, which was uh, explained in Svetankov and Boiland uh, paper. Uh, what it does, that model, it splits everything, the demand into two parts. Demand occurrence, whether we have uh, the demand or not, zeros and ones, and demand sizes, so the values themselves. Here is how the occurrence looks, and we can see that it actually seems to be changing over time, because you can see that frequency here, of frequency of black lines, is much lower than at the end of the data. So we see that uh, people are starting buying our product more and more often. Uh, Okay, so what can we do? We, we sort of say that the probability that our product will be bought is, is in, increases over time. Uh, and we actually also can assume that when it comes to predicting for the holdout for, for the future, then it will increase as well. So we can use the model with the trends to predict this pred probability. You see, I'm using my own judgment in this case, and I'm deciding what to use uh, on my own, although I could ask the function to do this automatically. So this is uh, how I fit the model for the occurrence part. Uh, this is how it evolves over time, and it's not very well uh, seen here, but the blue line goes a bit uh, upwards. So we're saying that over the next few days, the probability that they will buy our product will increase. Now, what about the data itself? Uh, the sizes actually increase over time as well, right? Because in the beginning it was around 2, 3, 4, then it goes uh, up further and further, 10, 12. So yes, um, there is some tendency here as well. But let's, for, for this specific case, we will use automatic components uh, selection. The reason why I didn't use automatic for occurrence part is because uh, it's very difficult to select uh, the model when you just have zeros and ones. That's why it's uh, preferable to use judgment, I would say. Uh, but when it comes to demand sizes, then we can tell the function to select from the pure multiplicative models. That's what YYY stands for. Uh, why multiplicative? Well, because uh, we don't want our data to be negative, right? We assume that it is uh, positive. Uh, right, so we feed that model, we produce forecast, and uh, I decided to align this task with uh, what typically happens in practice. In practice, when we sell uh, some product and we know that, well, demand is intermittent, uh, and even if it's not intermittent, we are not interested in each specific uh, value for each specific observation. We're interested in uh, getting forecast over some period of time uh, and then forming working and safety stocks based on that. So you order your product today, you will get it in 28 days. Yeah, it's a bit artificial, but uh, so what? You get it in 28 days and during this period, you need to have enough products on your shelves, right? So that's the idea that I have here. I'm asking for cumulative values. I'm only interested in upper bound. So this corresponds to safety stock over this uh, lead time of 28 days. That's how it looks. It's not very informative, uh, too much data. Let's zoom in. Not very informative either because this is sort of a mean over timeline. So we, the easier thing to do is just uh, sum up all those uh, cases when we sell something and compare them with the uh, safety stock that we have and working stock. So here it is. The black dot here is the cumulative value over 28 days. The blue line is our working stock and uh, the red dotted line is safety stock. So what is we are saying here, we should um, stock around 49 units. And uh, in our specific case, in this specific holdout, 
we actually sold 40, I don't know, 45, something like that. Uh, the good thing is that all of this comes just from the model, naturally from the model. So we don't assume anything additional, anything specific. We don't need to do anything uh, more. Right, so this is an example of intermittent demand. The final case is uh, multiple seasonal models. When there is more than just one uh, seasonal in the data, what do you do? Uh, I have the following example. This is daily sales of a food product. Uh, and what we will discuss here inspi was inspired by several papers uh, by James Taylor and some uh, other colleagues of his. So what, what can we say about this data? First, we can see that uh, there is a pattern inside each week. So there is a seasonality of seven. Uh, okay, people have uh, patterns in their behavior. They come to the shops and buy more, let's say, uh, over the weekend. No, it does not sound realistic. But anyway, you get the idea. On one hand. On the other hand, we have uh, a bit of yearly uh, seasonality here. It's not very obvious from this data, but uh, I tell you that uh, you, you can believe me <laughs> when I say that. And the other interesting thing, there are zeros here, so nobody works on Christmas. Um, that's why we have zeros in the data. And there is no obvious trend here. It seems like the data has uh, just level evolving over time. Let's take all this information into account when we construct our model. So our first model is uh, MNM, so multiplicative error, no trend, multiplicative seasonality, lags uh, of 7 and 30, uh, 365, uh, and uh, horizon and holdout. Now, this thing is a bit weird because we know that uh, some years have 366 days, not 65. Well, good news is that uh, if you provide uh, uh, an object with date here, for example, zoo object, then a function will automatically shift values when it comes to 29th of February. So our pattern will stay uh, as it needs to be for days of year. That's what we get. Uh, I zoomed in directly because uh, it would be unreadable. Um, what do we have? It was constructed in 12 seconds. Uh, it needed, the function needed to optimize 375 parameters, which is not a trivial task. Uh, and honestly, I'm not sure that we've uh, reached the optimal value of parameters here. But uh, it is what it is. We can improve upon it if we want to. AACC is 26,295. And here are the error measures. Alternative uh, would be to use a different initialization. So instead of optimizing all those seasonals, uh, 365 seasonals, uh, and then uh, plus seven seasonals and so on and so forth, we could use uh, backcasting. The idea is that you feed the model, you go through the first observation till the very last in the sample, then you revert the model and uh, move backwards, and then you obtain the initials by doing this uh, backward movement. And that's what we have. Good news, this takes only 0 0.2 seconds which is much better. Uh, AAC here is not comparable with the previous because we have a, a different number of parameters to different initialization and so on. And in this case, we only have four parameters, which is uh, nice. Uh, error measures, I think they are both slightly smaller than in the previous case. Okay, can we misbehave a bit more? Well, yeah, yes we can, obviously. <laughs> uh, you see, we have days of week, and days of year in our model. And in a way, this is the information that is a bit, uh, sounds duplicate. So why not have days of week and then weeks of year? Because uh, then if we have this split into two parts, we have less uh, parameters to estimate and still this sort of model would be reasonable. So that's what I, I'm trying to do here. I just run a function from Graybox which generates factors for weeks of year. And I include this as explanatory variable in the model. And so I experimented with this approach several times on different types of data and it worked quite well. 
Uh, in our case, I don't think it does better than the previous model. Uh, so we don't use backcasting here. We just optimize 62 parameters. 62 is much better than uh, 300, whatever I had on the, one of the previous slides. AAC is actually not smaller. So this seems that in this specific case, uh, this approach is not, uh, not worth it. And uh, lux equal to seven, so I'm still maintaining the same seasonal for days of week, but I'm modeling weeks of year through uh, explanatory variable. And just uh, to tick all the boxes, this is another model, but let me not uh, stop here for long. Anyway, the message here is actually the conventional double seasonal ETS uh, with multiplicative components seems to be doing better. And they've asked to produce uh, prediction intervals for different uh, values. It's a bit messy actually on this slide. Right, so this all, all of this just demonstrates you what you can do in the area of demand forecasting. Uh, as you can see, you can have models for conventional time series on monthly, quarterly, or whatever level, or you can have higher frequency data in fact, you can have then different combinations, like um, maybe you can have seasonal and intermittent, which is much more difficult to estimate and to, to, to work with, but is, it is potentially possible. And I didn't cover the aspect of ETS plus ARIMA in this presentation, unfortunately, because I, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem that we need it that in our cases. But in some situations, you might want to introduce AR1, for example, uh, and this is possible to do in the uh, Atom function. Right, so conclusions. Atom, as you see, is a new flexible model that supports many features. It was mainly developed for demand forecasting, but uh, you can use it for your area of interest. Uh, it can be, can be used uh, for standard problems instead of ES and ETS. In fact, I've uh, done experiment and I've written a post uh, on my website recently summarizing how it performs in comparison with these two functions. And it does much faster, it works much faster than ES and it outperforms ES in terms of uh, accuracy. It uh, performs quite similar to ETS, uh, but uh, it's not as fast as ETS, unfortunately. It includes ARIMA, so you can include orders of uh, ARIMA. It can handle explanatory variables, uh, intermittent data, multiple seasonalities. In fact, it can do a lot of things, honestly. The list included uh, 20 elements when I started looking at uh, what it does. And being the new and uh, complex model, obviously it contains tons of bugs. So when I prepared for this presentation, I fixed 10 more bugs or something like that. Uh, and this is still ongoing process. So if you find any issues, please send me a message or file uh, an issue on GitHub and I will fix it as soon as possible. That's it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in the chat and Robert will uh, ask them. And uh, one last thing, we will share the video of this presentation and we will also share slides. So stay tuned. Thanks, Ivan. Um, we've got a number of questions. Uh, um, the first is concerned with intermittent demand um, about negative values. How, do, how does it deal with negative values? Mm -hmm. So, good question. Well, if you assume that there are negative values, then you can use uh, additive model, pure additive model, for example, assuming normality or something like that. Um, Ivan, I think the question was more relating to negative values for the lower quantiles. Yes, I, I, I'm ah. afraid ah, I didn't this one. report it accurately. Yeah, this is uh, actually a good question because uh, there are no negative values for quantiles in this function if you use the default distribution. The default distribution here is inverse Gaussian, which uh, only produces positive values. So when you deal with intermittent uh, demand, it will generate you zero, I guess, when it is lower quantile. So there is nothing additional that you need to do with that. 
the, <clears throat> the second question is about outlier detection and how that's incorporated. And uh, is that possible to automatically correct the data so you've got a revised demand data series? Mm, th thanks, that's also a good question. So at the moment, there is a very basic mechanism for outliers detection. There is auto Adam that has uh, parameter outliers. What it does, uh, it fits the model. Then it looks at the residuals, uh, the standardized residuals. If it finds those that are beyond 95% interval, then it will consider those as outliers, fit the model with uh, explanatory variables, and if this is better than the previous model, then uh, you have the model that takes them into account. Uh, if you have uh, some great ideas of how to make it better, please send me a message and uh, I will consider implementing some other approaches. The um, next question is concerned with multiple seasonality. Uh, the example you gave had two seasonal uh, uh, components. Um, but what happens if you need uh, you you a priori speci specify too many seasonalities? How does that uh, simplify? Does it simplify automatically? Uh, I'm not sure what uh, what is the, the exact question here. <coughs> maybe uh, uh, mm -hmm. maybe the questioner uh, Aga can expand on that question then. Right, so uh, let me let me just tell you what uh, I have at the moment here. So if you have, for example, uh, several seasonal components, then it is up for you to select and uh, tell the function what the components are. It's like seven days of, uh, or whatever, 24 hours per day, then uh, 24 times seven hours in week, and then number of hours in year, things like that. If you refer to the idea that maybe some of the uh, seasonal components are similar, for example, Monday and Tuesday, then function does not uh, consider this. It would uh, assume that uh, every seasonal is just different one. Hope this uh, explains it. Perhaps uh, Aga can come back if it doesn't. Barman asks about the, the making a distinction between an outlier and an extreme value. Um, rather a philosophical question, I think. But uh, anyway, what, what are your thoughts about that? That's a very philosophical question indeed, Barman. Uh, uh, well, maybe outlier would be the value that uh, we do not expect at all. So something that happens because of uh, either uh, we recorded the data incorrectly or because there is a factor that we didn't uh, take into account, like promotion. It, statistically, it would be considered as an outlier. Then the question is how you treat it. As for extreme value, in my opinion, maybe it's wrong. Uh, that would be the case when this is still acceptable, but uh, just lying further than all the other observations. But that's that's a good question. Yeah, let's discuss it at some point. I mean, we do know that at least with um, ARIMA, I think, and certainly exponential smoothing, uh, outliers except uh, at the very final uh, data points before the forecast origin have little effect on the forecasts and the uh, relative accuracy. Um, so, on the other hand, in regression, it seems to me that outliers are potentially stroke extreme values uh, because I, I'm really not sure of the uh, the, the difference uh, are potentially dangerous. Certainly, if you want to uh, emphasize a particular coefficient or use it to estimate some optimal policy or other. So that that is a, a, an issue there about uh, replacing and identifying extremes. Yes, uh, I want to add something to this. Uh, you're quite right uh, that typically when outliers happen in the middle of the data, then point forecasts uh, are not affected by them if we talk about ETS or RIMA. However, if we're interested in the prediction intervals, then the value that happens somewhere in the middle and 
lies further would impact the width of prediction interval. So that's why it still makes sense if you can to take them into account because then you can decrease the uncertainty of the prediction interval. So that becomes useful, I guess. Ivan, let me ask you, um, you you've in many ways combined a number of existing R packages, but you've also made some uh, novel innovations. What do you see uh, the advantage, the, the particular advantages of adopting your, uh, adopting Adam, if Adam can be adopted? <laughs> hmm, that's a good question. Mm. Well, I'm thinking that uh, this approach could be beneficial if you want to to, <laughs> to do something uh, more advanced, either for research or for your uh, practical purposes. For example, uh, as I mentioned, you can have exponential smoothing and then start building upon it, introducing autoregressive components and so on. In fact, uh, we actually have some papers that uh, mention that, uh, for example, you can have multiple seasonal model and it can be improved if you include uh, AR1, something like that, some ARIMA ARMA components. Uh, so there, there is this thing in the literature, but there are no functions for this. So this is just an instrument you can use for your purposes. I would say maybe experimenting is uh, one of the important aspects here. It gives you flexibility. Let me pursue this. If you take um, relative performance in various competitions, TBATS has proved to be pretty successful. Um, uh, and TBATS with uh, explanatory variables. How, how does that relate to the, um, the system that you're proposing? Mm -hmm. Also a good question. Um, when I started working on these multiple frequencies, I was also thinking of uh, implementing some aspects of TBUDs, but I haven't done that yet and I'm not sure that uh, I want to. I haven't compared uh, the performance of my model with TBUDs. I think in order to have a proper comparison, I would need to collect uh, higher frequency data more more of it uh, than do some sort of experiments. Uh, so yeah, I cannot tell you whether it is better than TBATS or not. TBATS is actually quite good uh, forecasting method, but I haven't also seen TBATS with explanatory variables. Maybe I didn't search well for it, but I haven't noticed it yet. Yeah. I think Patricia may have some. <laughs> Okay. Um, and Barman has another question about accepting all types of regression models, such as lasso. Mm. Also, good question. As I say, uh, Adam has a custom loss function, so you can specify whatever you want uh, and use it for the estimation. It also has some default ones. It wasn't very difficult to implement, so. It is. Uh, it has conventional uh, MSE-based loss. It has uh, likelihood, and it also has lasso and uh, ridge, but they're both in a way experimental because we don't fully understand how to use them in exponential smoothing. I think, but they're already there. If you want to experiment, please go ahead. And uh, perhaps we should take a last question. Should we? Is there a last yeah. question? Yeah. Always, always difficult to ask the last question. John, you're there. You can ask the last question. <laughs> Hi, Ivan. Um, maybe Hi. could you just say a little bit more about the the question of comparison? You just mentioned the flexibility in comparison, and just say a little bit more about that. Just expand on it. Mm -hmm. By comparison, you mean? Uh, of oh, the comparison, I'm thinking of comparison of models and model selection, particularly. Yeah. So, uh, what is implemented in the function is this information criteria extraction, which allows you to compare different models directly based on information criteria. Is this something you're? So, is is I suppose my question is: is that the only automatic method? Yeah. 
or is there anything else? I mean, obviously you report other things, of course. You showed us that in the in the presentation. Yes, uh, by default, this is uh, the main method of selecting things. Uh, I haven't developed anything else, to be honest. Um, but potentially could be improved. Um, yeah, potentially what you could do, could do is you can use rolling origin function and then uh, extract values and compare based on the holdout performance. Uh, but this is not done. This is not automated in the function. So information criteria only. OK, thanks. Thank you. Ivan, let me th thank you uh, on behalf of CMAF for the, this interesting seminar. And uh, let me reiterate that the uh, this webinar will be published, available, I guess, on YouTube in the foreseeable future. Um, and do keep in contact with us since we uh, will be filling you in on forthcoming uh, webinars as well as uh, the latest pieces of uh, published research or available research, I should say. Uh, thank you all and uh, have a good weekend.